recording is now on. Uh, and what we're doing today is we're going to be looking at the rules in Ryland's v. Fletcher. It's one of the cases of looking at the area of escape from property and damages that occur from the escape. And just a bit of background. Uh, over here. No, that doesn't work. Uh, the rule in Rylands and Fletcher's is, is a source of much controversy. You can see there, there are a few cases upon which such magnificent episodes of theory have been erected, and few which in the process have been so sadly misunderstood. And this goes to, I'm trying to, where to put this without actually getting in the way. I'll put the chat at the bottom, I'll put the chat at the bottom. Ah, yeah, there we go, that's much better. Uh, but it is a question of an area of law that has been misunderstood, has been uh, contested a lot, and there are ongoing questions across the common law areas of the world, so Ireland, England, uh, the UK as a whole, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Should Rylands and Fletcher, should the rule under Rylands and Fletcher still exist, or should it be assumed, should it be incorporated into the general area of nuisance? And that's what they're looking at here. Uh, some lawyers are trying to make uh, it happen. It's like Fetch, but it's Rylands and Fletcher. I wrote that, I thought of that joke last night. I thought it was hilarious. If you don't laugh, it's fine. Uh, I do recommend you watching Mean Girls. It is a good feel, a good, uh, it's good. It's a great movie, but also it's one of those feel good movies and we need them at this time and in these situations. So why don't we look at this? Uh, despite the area, the rule has given, uh, has seen very little uh, reported litigation in Ireland where it should be quite better. Uh, and this is partly because it, there is an overlap between nuisance and Rylands and Fletcher's. It should be higher based on how the rule is actually incorporated and how it, was, it has been developed. But there are some factors that we'll be looking at. At the end of the, uh, Friday, we'll be looking at how this hasn't actually come to be, that there are still some elements of it that there are still some questions and some pushback on its application in this day. And when you're looking at this, we're looking at... Um, uh, so this is the rule in Ryland Fletcher. It is a case I really would recommend reading, just if there's a case and it leads to a principle like this. It's like Donahue versus Stevenson. It is a case you should really be reading. Uh, reading the full case. I'll put up the link in the loop group, the, on the loop page to the case so everyone can have access to it. I think it might just be, a, I think it's Beerly or Eerly or one of the databases. I'll have it so you can just click on it and it'll, be, and it'll follow through. But the rule believe what you can see there, that the plaintiff was mining uh, coal with permission of the landowner. The defendant was mining coal and the premises adjoining the, that of the plaintiff. The defendants had built a reservoir uh, to supply water to their uh, the mill on the, on their land, and these are important factors because we'll be looking at how that will affect later cases of the permission aspect. Uh, they were doing it with permission. They were doing it on a, on a scale for commercial mining, and the defendant was also engaging in commercial mining, and they had a mill. And really, the question, the issue with Ryan Fletcher is: Are you liable for elements or the accrual or accumulation of elements, objects, whatever, uh, that are on your property and they escape causing damage. And we'll be looking at what escape means and what accrual and accumulation means as well of what can be considered an object in this case. Uh, but in this, in the case of Rylands v. Fletcher, it was water that was stored in a reservoir uh, and work can be done by the independent contractors and they'd done so negligently that there was a disused shaft of a mine to, uh, under the reservoir, which communicated, which links into the plaintiff's mine. So there was a series of mine shafts and uh, cave systems. Uh, and this led then to the reservoir breaking into the shaft and flooding the, plant, the plaintiff's mine. So they were suing the defendant for the water escaping from the reservoir. And they were looking at this by saying the water was unnaturally stored there. The water itself wasn't, it wasn't a lake, it wasn't naturally forming, it was placed there with an intended commercial purpose. And that's what the court were, were looking at. And they had been looking at it and they faced in this fully there. There had been no trespass since the damages had, 
committed had, uh, by the flooding had not been a direct consequence of the defendant's activities, that they were independent contractors. Uh, the defendants were not guilty of nuisance since there had only been a single escape. And this is where something we'll be coming back to later of, is it a constant uh, or near constant escape uh, of an element, an object, or whatever it is from a property to another? Or is it a one-time occurrence? And we'll be looking at this a little bit in, and just sometimes this might be difficult to wrap your head around what can be stored on a property and how it can escape. Pretty much this means anything going from your property in the, from the perspective of nuisance, anything coming from your property and leaving your property to go into another will count as escape. And this we'll be looking at can include noise. This can include vibrations. This can include uh, light or the restriction of light and how this goes on. This is a bit more of a nuisance we'll be looking at, but it's just to help you get your head around the idea of what is escape uh, and a single escape. And the defendant, they weren't guilty of this, that it was a single event, and they couldn't be considered uh, liable for the negligence of building the mine shaft and not, in, not ensuring there was no secondary or abandoned and disused element, uh, mine shafts connecting the two properties because they had hired independent contractors. And we had looked at this before in relation to liability of employer's liability and vicarious liability for independent contractors. Where does that draw the line? And that's what they held here. And you can see there that liability was still imposed on the defendant. And that this was a similar case. This was a big upturn in absolutely everything. And you can see there that Blackburn J stated that we think that the, that the true rule of law is that the person who, for his own purposes, brings on his lands and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief if it escapes, must be must keep in it in it must keep in it in it must keep it in at his peril. And if he does not do so, is prima facie one of is prima facie answerable to for all the wrongs which, in natural course, uh, natural consequences of its escape. Uh, that's a good quote. I butchered reading it because. I just can't seem to read today. Uh, but that was the definition. But as I said, and you can see there that it's anything likely to, to do mischief is, if it escapes. This is mischief in the sense of harm, not mischief in the sense of a harmless practical joke or Loki taking over Germany in the first Avengers movie. But it is a question of they're liable for the mischief and the harm it caused if they escape. And they are prima facie answerable for this. And the House of Lords quickly affirmed that decision, saying, yes, they are absolutely answerable. And this is just the, a larger quote from the House of Lords. Uh, I'm not reading it out because um, there's no need for me to read it out, but I just I included it because it's an interesting quote, and I'll help just ground the reading if you want. Uh, so when to, with that rule, it was adopted then in the Hanron versus Merrick Sharp and Dunk uh, from Ireland Limited. This was the adoption of the principles where Henley J defined uh, the rule by reference to a thing which is likely to do mischief if it escapes. Rather, uh, and in doing so, he did, rather than mentioning any requirement of non-use, non-natural use. And this is where really the core of the question was in of what is non-natural use. And note that while Henley J didn't include the reference to non-natural use, it wasn't rejecting the body of case law that I have built up around it. It just wasn't relevant to the facts in Hanrahan versus American Sharp and Dom. Uh, but we'll be looking at what is the non-natural use a little bit later. But, so re but it, it is sufficient to say that the courts in Ireland had accepted rules under Rylands and Fletcher in a, as a thing which is likely to, to do mischief if it escapes. And we're going to be looking at the scope then. Uh, of the rule of what do you need to escape, what are requirements for this, how do you store it, as well as some of the elements of what can be stored in the property. Uh, and you can see there that Blackburn J emphasized that the defendant has brought something onto his land, which must be something dangerous, something which will naturally do mischief if it escapes out of his land. And this, unfortunately, gives, may give an idea that the thing on the land is sentient or it's alive or it can think or it will deliberately cause mischief. Uh, and that's not really true. A lot of these cases are in relation to inanimate objects and their fire, water, uh, land itself is a question of uh, cannot escape. 
uh, if it's incorrectly stored. But some of the cases do relate to animals being stored. And there is a case of, I can't remember the name of it, it's on one of the later slides, of if people are can be invited onto the land, can, they, can you be held for their escape and the damages they caused? And when I explained this concept to, I was doing a practice lecture with a colleague, uh, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't do law, but I was trying to explain this concept to him. And the way you could describe it is, if you bring 40 Danny DeVitos onto your land, if you invite them in, I don't know how there's 40 Danny DeVitos because he's one and only treasure, but if you bring 40 Danny DeVitos onto your land and they escape causing harm, you will be liable for the actions of the Danny DeVitos. And I found that was a good illustration of, the, of that point, but the idea of 40 Danny DeVitos escaping causing mischief will stick in your mind, especially if you've watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, and do bear in mind, there is a difference between Frank Reynolds and Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito was a saint, Frank Reynolds, not so much. Uh, but it is that question of any, the, expand, the expanded that rule of what can cause mischief, uh, anything which, if it should escape, may cause damage to his neighbor. So it went there from the idea of mischief to a more concrete definition of damages to their neighbor. And we've looked at uh, this in tort law before. Who is your neighbor? Really, anyone can be your neighbor. Uh, anyone who is, has proximity to you and can uh, be harmed by your actions. And it is any harm to your neighbor. And this will also include the general public, or in some cases, some of the cases will refer to it as a public highway. This is just legal talk and old, old, ye olde uh, court talk for public roads. They, they call them highways uh, in this case. So if you, if you have any items or anything on your land that escapes into a highway, if you come across that in your notes, if you come across that in the books, the articles, the journals, or whatever, that just means the roads, the road system. So when we're looking at this, the, uh, the concept of liability is then contingent on non-natural on non use. And the use of this phrase, phrase itself is ambiguous because what is non-natural? And there's two options there. It would merely mean that the land in its natural state should not be subject to any liability. So if you have a field, as the field is, that's not that's its natural state. Or it could be it could relieve the defendant from responsibility in respect of any artificial but nonetheless ordinary and natural accumulation of, onto his land. So if you have land and you use it in a perfectly ordinary sense of say it's a house. What you are using, you're storing electricity, you're storing fire, you're in the sense of fuel or gas, heating, whatever. You're storing water because you have a piping system going to your house. This would be a natural and an ordinary accu uh, accumulation on your land. And that's actually what the, the definition of court went for. Louder definition took supremacy. It is that it is defendant could. It could relieve the defendant from responsibility in respect of artificial. So the water in your house isn't naturally forming there unless you build your house over like a uh, waterfall. Somehow. I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, but everyone, your the piping would be artificial. Home plumbing is artificial, but it's still an ordinary and technically natural accumulation on the land. And you can see there that non natural is something. Is, some, uh, some special use bringing with it an increased danger to others and must not merely be the ordinary use of the land or such a use as is proper for the general benefit of the community. And this is what they were looking at. Though. You can have the artificial sense of this is man-made, this is cultivated, curated, sculpted, uh, constructed, however you want to phrase it, and it would still fall within the natural use of land. If you have a house, the natural use of the house is to live in it, and this would require having certain, el certain elements of heat, water, electricity, etc. cetera. Uh, so their use and their storage in the house would be a natural use, and that would be okay. And this is a question that the, na the non-natural use doesn't require the owner to leave the land as it is. If you have land and it's dangerous, or if your land is greater risk you don't have to allow nature to, to just but more than just would be more in a sense of, of traditional fields and parks or na countryside nature 
uh, naturally, so you don't have to leave it to nature. You can cultivate it, you can cure it, you can use it as you see fit. It's only when we get to the excessive or extraordinary use uh, is when the non-natural element comes in. And the example there of water in the piping uh, for domestic use would not be considered uh, non-natural. It would be considered artificial, it would be considered man-made, but it would be perfectly appropriate and it would fall outside the rules of Rylands and Fletcher. But as the actual case, Rylands and Fletcher, uh, a reservoir for, built for large quantities uh, in a domestic situation or a commercial situation wouldn't be, would fall within the Rylands and Fletchers as the defendant would be liable uh, as, they, as they should, they knew or ought to have known there was a risk and they should have taken additional steps to ensure that risk was sufficiently mitigated or sufficiently resolved or they have enough to realize this is a reservoir of water, what do we have in place if it leaks? And then that really goes to the idea that the characterization of the non-natural use is of particular significance. It is the important factor. Uh, it is the important factor. It is a fact you have to develop in the case. And if you can, if the defendant can show that there was a non-natural use, it will be a strict liability. Uh, it will be the application of strict liability that you don't need to show any more that because you will be able to show, look, they knew the risk or they, they, and they didn't do anything about it. But at the same time, the case law on the area is quite confusing and quite inconsistent of what you think could be uh, non natural use. So in one instance, when you swap out the element, the object, the accumulated source, or whatever it is, uh, to another, the situation can quickly change. So, what we're going to be looking at a little bit. Is on the next slide. Yeah, it's on the next few slides. Is how different elements or different. I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure the right word for it. It's like the, the sources or items accumulated and stored, excuse me, on the property, uh, how they are stored and how they can escape will have an impact. And when you're looking at this, one of the problems you can see there is that the courts determine this based on the te scientific, technological, and safety environments of the time. So some courts from the 1940s may have approved that this was the correct method, uh, that the use of machinery in, say, draining a bog, as, as one example, was okay, or there was the unnatural use of the land. But from a modern perspective now, if we examine it now, Using the machinery would be, would be the safest and most efficient use of the of the land and how it was worked. So it may not fall within Rylands and Fletcher's if that case was decided today. So just you have to be aware of the time where it was the case was considered, and also what was the item being stored? Was it a luxury back then? If you look at electricity in the early 1900s, did everywhere have it? If you look at home heating. Did everywhere have it? Uh, if you look at the availability of oil, was it everywhere or is it, was it rare going forward in a couple of years? Will there be oil everywhere or will it be a super rare commodity? And it's that that storage may be considered uh, extraordinary and fall within the definition of Rylands and Fletchers. If we do get that situation, I think there's going to be more problems of an oil shortage than Rylands and Fletcher, but we'll deal with that when we come to it. So the first one is, is that one is uh, water. So Ryan and Fletcher itself is a case relating to the escape of water from a property. And the accumulation of water may, consider, may constitute a non-natural uh, use of the land. But for this, it would have to be on a large and non-domestic scale. In Ryan and Fletcher itself, it was a reservoir for commercial purpose. But in... Uh, the two cases you can see at the bottom, Imperial Tobacco versus Hart, and Coinstar, Carstairs, Carstairs versus Taylor. Uh, water for domestic use in, in relation to heating and plumbing of, your, of a single house was permitted. It was for, allowed as a natural use of the land. It wasn't natural in the sense of it happened by itself. It was an artificial creation, but it fell, within the it fell outside the definition of Rylands versus Fletcher. You contrast then with carrying cross electricity supply versus hydraulic power. That large quantities under the water of a main street and mains under the street constituted non natural use. So, again, 
so here it goes to the question of what is the quantity? Um, water being pumped under a street for, from one house will be allowed. If it escapes, it's outside the rules of Rylands and Fletcher. But if it's in a large quantity for commercial or industrial purposes, that's beyond the use of the natural use of the land. And that will give rise to a claim under like Rylands and Fletcher. And in Ireland, we have, we have a lot of bogs. It's, it's quite simple. And there's questions of should bogs, the drainage of bogs, fall within Rylands and Fletcher? And you can see there, the drainage of bogs is a matter of considerable importance in this country because we have a lot of them. And the two cases there were examining this, that the farmer operating the bog, uh, operating the drains on the bog and the water escaping probably wouldn't fall within the rules of Rylands and Fletcher. So again, it's the natural use of the land. It's while it's, it's, it may be artificial, the drains, it is a purpose and it is at the domestics and small level scale uh, of the land, so that's not the issue. But in the second case, uh, the commercial exploitation of the bog will have a different issue. And this is this case was actually from the 1940s, where the commercial expo exploitation of the bogs with heavy machinery was uh, within the rules of Ryland and Fletcher. And any water that has escaped as a result of this commercial exploitation, this commercial harvesting of the bogs, uh, gave rise to a, a case of under Rylands and Fletcher. But the courts, would, if they were looking at this now, would, have, would likely say that's just the correct way to exploit the material. That's the correct way and the, correct, and the safest way to actually harvest the bog. Uh, and that could fall within the natural use then. It would depend on how that case was challenged nowadays. But just it's an example to show where you go from that. Uh, I'm waving my hand around. Uh, where you go from the domestic to commercial sense or com domestic to an industrial sense and how that can change over 80 years, uh, 80 odd years, that's so probably about 75, uh, how that can change over the time. So the next one is we're looking at the definition of, I'm not the definition of trees because trees are trees. <coughs> Uh, this is just a cough, I'm, I'm not sorry. Uh, but trees as a rule are not normally under the rules of violence and factory. And you can see there from the case Noble versus Harris, they held that a peach tree is an unusual and normal, in, is a usual and normal incident in, incident in the English country. It develops by snow nat slow natural growth. Its branches are not likely to cause damage, even if, even if permitted to expand outwards over the highway. Such a tree cannot be compared to a tiger, as spreading, uh, spreading fire or a reservoir in which huge weight of water is artificially accumulated uh, to be kept in bay by dams or nox noxious flames, nox noxious fumes or sewage. So trees, they kind of just happen. And that's a weird way to think about it, but they do grow, they're slow, they can be maintained, they can be curated. You can call them arborist, which I found out is the fancy word for tree surgeon. Uh, if the trees are at risk, they can be resolved before uh, the branches cause harm. And generally trees themselves won't fall within Rylands and Fletcher, but there are exceptions. Uh, and you can see there in Crowdhurst versus uh, Armistead Burial Board uh, and Ponting versus Noakes, if the tree is poisonous, uh, and this definition of poison isn't fatal, but uh, it can cause harm uh, by ingesting or coming into contact with it. Uh, liability may be imposed because there is a higher risk that should have been taken into account. Uh, but at this point, it requires the tree to escape to the neighboring property or the public highway for this to happen. And that's really what they're looking at. And it depends on the definition of poison, because poison, when you think of it, it's Kuzo's poison from the Emperor's New Groove. It's something that will really harm, kill you or seriously harm you just right at, in an instant. The poison from trees would be smaller and is more irritant, but still causing damage or risk to your animals and li and, or livestock. Uh, so that's where they're, they're looking at that. Uh, but the general rule is liability should not, be uh, should not be attached to the occupier for a tree not artificially grown by him unless he was aware or ought to have known that there is a danger arising from it. So if you see you have a property where there's this, a, let's say, a 100-year-old tree, hanging over a road and you see that tree is, is rotting or 
battery is not structurally sound anymore as a result of wind and damages, uh, you would then have to know or be aware there's a danger and risk to it and have it removed. Because in those cases, if the, you know the tree is a risk or causing a risk, uh, and it could fall off the property, literally falling over uh, and onto another's property or onto a public highway, then you would be liable because you should have known that tree is leaning at an angle or that tree is rotting. Uh, something has to be done about it. But that's the rule. Uh, the next slide I've got is, is a weird question because who should be liable for fruit? Would Groot fall within Rylands of Fletcher? If Groot escapes from the ship, or even gets, walks off the ship, are you liable? I, I just want to see if the GIF would actually work in uh, the PowerPoint as well, but it does. So there's going to be a lot more of these going forward. But the question then is, is uh, the Irish course, uh, they've had the walls uh, can fall within the scope of Rylands of Fletcher. It will depend on the facts. Uh, of where the wall was and is it facing a highway and can it do damage. Uh, but in the UK, they went quite clearly the other way. And in the cases, the tree cases there, the courts have said there's no question of any unnatural use of land. Trees are, sorry, walls are not going to come within Rylands and Fletcher. They will come up with, within other, if a falling wall and it, or walls that fall off your property or parts of walls that fall off, even bricks uh, from a wall, uh, that won't come within Rylands and Fletcher. So the English courts were quite clear about saying no, and they've held this case law quite well. And sometimes it is it's good just to show how certain areas and developing areas of law contrast between Ireland and England. I know for the most parts, I've been looking at Irish cases, but for Rylands and Fletcher's and Newsons, I'll be bringing in a few more English cases, and they can be used as a persuasive argument. Uh, but if there's an Irish case that goes contrary to it, and particularly our Supreme Court case, that case will have precedent in Irish, in Irish legal systems. Finally, the question of electricity, gas, and explosives. Uh, with, within their domestic use and within their reasonable use, and they won't fall within uh, Rylands and Fletcher. And the domestic use for explosions is just cooking uh, or heating, technically, is an explosive. Uh, but again, they won't fall in the rules of Rylands and Fletcher. But you have to take this in mind, and there's a few cases here, the non-domestic use of these substances, so large-scale use, uh, large-scale storage of, the, of gas, electricity, or explosive materials, uh, or other highly inflammable uh, materials, will fall within Rylands Fletcher's and may give rise to a case of strict liability of why was there gas canister stored? Why was there uh, an electricity plant or generators stored on location? Why was there fireworks and ex or ex actual explosives stored on a property and, and if the explosion actually escaped itself escapes if uh, it was in, if it was an issue if you were storing uh, blasting equipment for say the mine in Rylands and Fletcher and that caused an explosion to escape and the explosion is escaping it's just explosion crossing over the your land into your neighbor's land or the public highway that is how it will escape uh, that will give rise to strict liability so with Rylands and Fletcher, then, uh, these are other types of accumulation of stuff stored in the land that has escaped and caused damage, caused damage to the property of another, and uh, they, have, they were held as following the rules of Rylands and Fletcher for the non-natural use of the land. So a flight pole that had fallen over, fairground chair plane, which had caused damages by the chair coming off from loose and causing damage to the structure around the area. Vibrations, if you're playing music, this is more so for large scale vibrations of an industrial plant. The vibrations causing damages by crossing over, land, over the property and land, because that's how vibrations work, uh, causing damage. We'll look at this again in nuisance and how they differ. But it, vibrations escaping from the land, if uh, there's large scale machinery, they cause cracks or, uh, in walls or break glass. That would be vibrate, that damages from vibrations. Uh, there'd be building material and debris allowed to fall on neighboring land, causing blocking drains and causing a flood as a result of a new building being constructed. That was seen as a non natural use of land and that was uh, 
on the writings of Fletcher, Christmas tree decorations. So maybe not, we won't see them now because we're locked up. But um, if the decorations fall off lands, if the dec street decorations fall and cause harm, that's a non-natural use. That is technically them escaping onto a public highway often. And the last one is uh, a controversial case because it was a group of individuals uh, who had been invited onto the defendant's uh, campsite and were given permission by the defendant to be on the property. But uh, they left the campsite and caused damages to the surrounding area. Uh, and there was a question of would Rylands and Fletcher apply? And on, the courts had applied it. But yes, they had been invited. Uh, the use of the land as a campsite was a non natural use of the land. And the defendant would be liable because he invited them and that amounted to him uh, accumulating them on the land. And it was a very unusual case, but it was held uh, that that would fall under the rules of Ryland and Fletcher uh, because he invited them on, because they had escaped by the sense, in the sense of walking off the property and onto another and causing harm. And that was within Ryland and Fletcher. So that's the last slide on it. Uh, we'll stop there for today. I thought definitely a little bit longer just uh, if anyone has any further questions we can appear for another few minutes if you want to ask anything uh, we'll be looking at how the principle has, has been expanded and some of the defenses to Rylands and Fletcher and the future of it in comparison to other elements of court should it be incorporated into nuisance should it be its own thing how Ireland is doing it how some other jurisdictions are having a look at it and um, we'll be looking at that on Friday if you can, in the meantime, have a look at the problem questions I put up, or sorry, the essay questions I put up, if you haven't done so already. And uh, you just email me any questions and I'll have them, uh, I'll answer you in, in your email, but I'll also be able to relate it to the class on Friday from when we have our next class. So I'm going to stop recording now, but. Mm -hmm.